Good day, everyone. Welcome to the Introduction to E-Commerce webinar. I am your course coordinator, RM Sparrows. And for this video, we'll be discussing e-commerce startup management. This is our framework on how we would navigate in today's business environment that is full of uncertainty. This framework is more attuned to what's happening all around us. Now, specific topics for this video. First is uh, the e-commerce pillars, which is the difference between your typical physical businesses to e-commerce businesses. This is related to a question that uh, I received for this course. Uh, the question is, how can a typical business be different from uh, the, the, the physical one or the traditional one? How can I call a business an e-commerce one? So we'll be discussing that quickly. And this would be our takeoff to the e-commerce project that would be uh, the requirement for the course after the third activity, the third assignment. For the main topic of this video is about e-commerce startup management. It will be composed of principles, uh, particularly lean startup principle, and uh, how we define traction on how we can generate happy customers for our business in order for a sustainable way of getting revenues, profits for the business. Now, we start off with uh, e-commerce pillars. Basically, we have four e-commerce pillars that would be the critical success factor of any e-commerce business. This is also the difference between your typical traditional business uh, with respect to e-commerce online businesses so we have the electronic store this is where you would find the products or services that a business sells we have second payments this is how we would collect revenue from the customers electronically third we have logistics this is how we deliver the product or the service that your customers bought from you. And fourth, this is related to digital marketing. This is about content. Now, uh, you, would, you would ask me, this should be digital marketing. But in today's business environment, digital marketing is basically practiced by, by both physical businesses, traditional businesses, and online businesses so the main difference would be the content with that which we'll be discussing later for the electronic store we have four types of platforms that we can start for our e-commerce business the traditional businesses have the physical store for e-commerce ones we have this owned website managed website marketplaces and social media e-commerce businesses usually don't have the physical store they only have an electronic store showing their products to their customers the physical physical spaces that electronic commerce use might be used for logistics for warehousing inventories but not for the the as a major touch point wherein the customer and the business interact. The main interaction happens on electronic stores. Now, we discussed these four types. We have the owned website. For the owned website, this is where you would prepare your own server, maybe outsource a server from hosting providers. You buy domains, and then you install open source software, 
or maybe your own developed software on that server. Basically, you own everything and you have the full flexibility. However, this would be too costly for a startup business, especially for small online um, businesses. This would be uh, would incur overhead costs. And the management maintenance would be more difficult. It, it, it requires a little bit of programming, web, web development skills, because you would maintain troubleshoot problems and uh, upgrade whatever software you have installed on that server. Second, this is for e-commerce businesses that don't have that much capability in terms of web development. We have the managed website or some call it software as a service. The, the service is website uh, or e-commerce website. That's a service. They offer e-commerce website typically for e-commerce or any type of business that do electronic transaction. The, the perfect example of a managed website is Shopify. This is where you pay around 700 to 1,000 per month and they would offer you a platform where you just put in images, you put description, prices, and then you would have your e-commerce you would have your e-commerce business on that managed website. So you just pay the monthly fee. And then the monthly fee, uh, it includes server maintenance, troubleshooting, the server disk space, and all. You don't have to worry about the technical stuff. You just you, you will just focus on the selling part of your e-commerce business. So that's a good thing in, in, in managed websites. You would have the full uh, focus on the selling part, not on the technical operational um, aspect of maintaining a website, though it requires a monthly fee and some integration with other software uh, that would require some a bit of premium for uh, a business. Third, we have marketplaces. Um, most some some students would ask me, "Do we really need to build a website or an application to start an e-commerce business?" The answer is no. You can just sign up in marketplaces, or in that marketplace have or has customers in them. You just need to start a merchant account and then start selling. Perfect example are the Lazadas and Shopees in the Philippines. So you just start an account there. And when you start, you can put in pictures, select the shipping, prices, and then you're good to go. You can sell immediately. Fourth is social media. Social media, because in the Philippines, we are the number one social media consumers in the world. Our screen time is the highest in the world when we're talking about social media. So naturally, when all Filipinos are in social media, most of the traffic, most of the activity engagement are there. Most e-commerce businesses would want to host where people are. So social media, uh, the number one social media in the Philippines is Facebook, followed by, I think, uh, Facebook includes Instagram and, and Facebook Messenger. Others could be um, Pinterest, Twitter. But the, the famous one where you can start an e-commerce store is Facebook. Uh, second is Instagram. You can start a business account there through a Facebook page or an uh, Instagram business account. You can start selling there. Um, there are third-party applications that would enable a more robust e-commerce store. But at the very minimum, you can just open a page, post pictures, and then interact. Interact with your customers directly.
Now, the question is, what is the, the, the appropriate electronic store platform to use? If you have, if you are selling or reselling items and you don't have uh, a brand yet, I would suggest starting on marketplaces and social media because the traffic, the engagement are there. Now, as you evolve into a brand where you, the brand stands for something or the brand has an identity, you would start to develop your own website or maybe a managed website wherein you can have the full flexibility. Because if you have a brand and you have a following, you want to get as much profits as you can and you want to control the content and how the business works. So it's better to have an own website for a more mature e-commerce business and then use marketplaces and social media as marketing tools. But for a small startup, a small uh, e-commerce selling business, it's better to start in marketplaces or social media because one, the overhead costs is lower. You won't have to spend for monthly website fees, monthly or yearly hosting or server fees, and third-party uh, providers that would help you maintain, upgrade, and troubleshoot your own website for you. So you won't have that overhead cost. So it's better to start either marketplaces or social media. So this is a good way to validate if your product would be selling and how it would be different uh, with regards to the typical merchants in that marketplace. So if you're selling a generic type of, of product in marketplaces, it would be very difficult. Maybe you would want to go to social media and uh, focus more on targeting specific customers. So it depends, but for small budget strap e-commerce businesses, it's more marketplaces and social media as a start. But for established one, a mature e-commerce business that will want to expand maybe, or businesses who have a brand or would want to start a brand, it's more of a website uh, either own or managed, but you would use marketplaces and social media as a marketing tool to expand or to extract users from those marketplaces and social media back to your own website. So that's some of the, the, the paths that e-commerce entrepreneurs would want to take, especially if they're starting a new venture. Payments. A question that I received just recently from some of the students in this class, in this course, is that what if I have a business and then I would just post pictures online, make some ads online on social media, maybe Google, would that be an e-commerce business? The answer is no, because e-commerce is defined as a transaction, an electronic transaction done by entities, businesses to consumers, business to business. So without an electronic exchange of value, it won't be called e-commerce in the first place. It is just a digital marketing tactic or a digital marketing strategy wherein you post something online and then those interested individuals would go to the business. So for an e-commerce business to thrive, in, it should have payment gateways wherein these services or these providers would uh, offer electronic exchange of value or money from the consumer to the business. So we have several types here in the Philippines. The most uh, 
common or no, not the most common, but uh, this is the most misconstrued uh, payment gateway. Uh, many Filipinos are scared in using their credit cards, but in reality, credit card payments are typically the most secure payment gateway available for us. Um, the issue in credit cards is that when someone stole your information prior to entering into the, the credit card payment gateway engine, uh, that would be risky. But if you securely put the information, your credit card number and all, on the payment gateway for credit cards, it would be the most secure one because there are standards for credit card payments. However, for a small business, getting credit card uh, POS or accreditation to several banks would be too costly. It would require huge transaction for you to have for you to uh, capture or at least uh, uh, pay for the transaction cost or the additional cost in the overhead. So majority of Filipinos use bank transfers, uh, the Instapay and PesoNet exchange or transfers or the typical deposit. This is because there are no associated costs. However, for e-commerce businesses that is growing, the management and the crowd reconciliation of payments of specific individuals to specific items would be too uh, labor intensive that you'll need to require some sort of automation. But for a typical small online business, bank transfers would work. The, the Insta credit or in, Insta pay and then the peso net, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, the exchange between different banks. Or you would have an instruction on how people would, would deposit on your bank. Third is electronic wallet. This is a sort of uh, a storage of value. Uh, the typical electronic wallet we know, or the most common electronic wallet we know is PayPal. You just need to assign an email and you, you just use your email to pay for things. That email holds value wherein you deposit or it is directly linked to your credit card or debit card. So that's electronic wallet. In the Philippines, we have electronic wallets in marketplaces, the Shopee Pay, Grab Pay, and any other payments of uh, ecosystems or marketplaces in the Philippines that can be called electronic wallets. Um, for me, for some of the business or the websites that I maintain, especially for some of the services, uh, don't, I don't use PayPal because the charges are a bit high. Uh, there are Philippine startups that uh, you can explore. One is uh, PayMongo, uh, a little bit lower, around 1% to 2% transaction fee. And PayPal is around 4, 4 to 5%. So imagine the difference if you're talking about hundreds of thousands. Um, yep, yep. So that's electronic wallets. Mobile wallets is where a, a, a value, a storage of value or a wallet is attached to a phone number. So this is the Gcash, the PayMaya of the world. So you just need to attach your identity to a certain number, have it verified, and you can transfer uh, currency to that mobile wallet and use the mobile wallet to pay for things. A lot of e-commerce businesses, especially the marketplaces, uh, offer payments via the Gcash and uh, Pay Maya. However, it's would it would be very difficult for a small merchant, especially a startup one, to integrate mobile wallets immediately because they would need uh, sort of volume in terms of the transactions. Fifth, we have online payments. Offline payments are 
a way to pay wherein a customer would buy an item online. And then when they pay, they would put their personal information. And after they click pay, they would be given a reference number. And that reference number would be used to pay for the item in physical stores. Physical stores such as uh, 7-Eleven, we have the banks, we have um, banks, uh, pawn shops. So that reference number would be used to match your order to the payment that would be uh, uh, giving to these physical stores. So that's offline payments. Cash on delivery, cash on delivery is also a payment option. Uh, however, this is not an electronic way to do things. However, uh, it is a way to, uh, to remove the business from the actual collecting of the payment from the customers. So usually cash on delivery options are offered by logistics providers or third-party delivery uh, providers. It requires a little bit of, of risk because delivery uh, individuals could get the money or there would be risk of returns. However, still the Philippines, the Philippines uh, relatively across the Southeast Asian region, the Filipino, uh, the typical Filipino is afraid to put their electronic information about their bank accounts online. So this is why cash on delivery is widely adopted in the Philippines. However, uh, I'm not really into cash on delivery, but when I inquired years ago, they would need a certain amount of volume for a business to uh, to offer cash on delivery or third party logistics provider to offer cash on delivery for them. The second option is the aggregators. Imagine the overhead cost. If you would get accreditation for credit card payments, for electronic wallets, mobile wallets, offline payment, and cash on delivery. Imagine the overhead of a small business. It would be huge. Now, the aggregators offer all of these services and offer, they have the accreditation with these individual uh, payment gateways such as credit card, bank transfer, uh, wallets, online wallets, and the cash on delivery offline payments. And then they would offer a service for you. The perfect example of these aggregators are uh, one is Dragon Pay, if you are familiar. Dragon Pay, uh, you just need to pay around 28,000 for a set of fee. They would offer you accreditation and then some uh, technical stuff. And after that, you can use their payment gateway and uh, the customer will be using Dragon Pay, have the option to use credit cards, to use bank transfer, through debit uh, card, yata. Yeah. electronic wallets, through PayPal, mobile wallets, Gcash, and then they could offer bank deposits uh, or uh, no, not, not cash and delivery. The first five, they would offer that for a little as 20 pesos per transaction. I think there are 30 pesos, 20, and 10 pesos per transaction, depending on the item. So they would offer that. Uh, this is one of the widely used aggregators in the Philippines. Uh, in fact, if you use, um, I think I, I just paid for uh, a bill. Meralco uh, bill, I forgot. A bill, uh, they use Dragon Pay because I, I paid uh, using Gcash just recently. And they would offer also credit cards. So this is a good way to start online payments. However, aggregators are sort of uh, would, would require a small business additional overhead costs, especially the, 
the set of fee. Um, the, the best aggregator, uh, which is similar to electronic ones that I use, is uh, PayMongo because they can uh, accept credit card payments for as little as 1% uh, transaction fee, 1% of the selling price. And then you can use Gcash. So those two uh, are some of the widely used electronic payment options that Filipino use. So uh, it would be enough for me. But that's for my case. Uh, you can explore. But for those who are not into additional overhead expenses or additional transaction costs, if ever you would, you would uh, subsidize for the transaction costs, Bank transfer would do, bank transfers. And uh, back, back before when I was doing actual e-commerce uh, business, we integrate the 4% additional charge of PayPal on the pricing so that it's like we are offering uh, free transaction fees, but it is in really integrated in the the pricing of the products consumers are selling. So make sure if you're doing a pure electronic uh, commerce business, make sure that you check the additional transaction fees and decide whether you would uh, subsidize for your customers or pass, uh, pass the transaction cost to your, your customer. Though uh, it would require uh, a little bit of planning because an increase in price would mean a decrease in demand for your electric for your products and services so these are the set of payment gateways available for you now for logistics uh, i would just simplify the logistics it's either you own the delivery service or you hire third party providers um, for third party, there are numerous third party providers there. Uh, it would matter based on your geographic location, your target market, where do you uh, intend to uh, push a product, maybe geographic, and then their reliability and their trustworthiness. Maybe if they offer cash on delivery, there are several criteria that would depend uh, on a type of business. So this would be uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. So you just need to find third-party services. If you want to uh, lower down the transaction costs because third-party logistics or, or delivery services would, uh, I think, cost you around 50 to 150 per shipment. So that would uh add to the costs and that would uh somehow increase uh, decrease the demand so you have the option to buy your own motorcycles your own uh, delivery vans while the transaction cost would be lower the capital the initial capital required to buy those um delivery equipment or or vehicles would be huge and uh, it depends on the scale, the number of transactions that you would want or you have. Uh, I think I have a friend before uh, who bought several motorcycles just for the delivery. They reduced their transaction cost. They reduced their overhead of additional cost or additional price that they charge on their product. However, another uh, risk of own own logistics or delivery is that you have the risk of accidents uh, and uh, uh, vehicles bogging down. So that would be a different kind of costs that anyone would consider. So the decision on whether you buy your own or you ask third party providers to uh, send the shipment for you 
is based on the volume of transaction and how much overhead cost would you uh, oh, you can absorb and also how much is the tolerance in the additional price you would be passing on to your customers. So this is a different big topic altogether, but for this sake, uh, it's just having to decide whether to own, to buy your own, or ask third-party services to do the shipments for you for a cost. Lastly, uh, this is related to digital marketing. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, digital marketing is now blurred in whatever business here in the Philippines or, or anywhere in the world. Before the pandemic, online businesses usually use digital marketing. The traditional businesses, the, the physical, uh, the small businesses just use the, the typical uh, traditional marketing tactics, posters, flyers, but because of the pandemic, everyone is doing digital marketing in whatever form, maybe just posting on Facebook, having a profile wherein they would ask their friends. It's part of digital marketing. What separates an e-commerce businesses to the typical business is content. How? First is the representation. The representation of your product and services are pictures and text. So the better your picture, the better your text that to describe the picture, to describe the benefits of the product and service you're offering, the better chances you'll be noticed by your customers. So that is a representation. That is why there is a full course on how to do uh, product photography, basically bridging the gap of the senses uh, because Filipinos like to touch products before they buy. So the better your picture, the better you are in bridging the gap in terms of uh, satisfying the senses of customers. Second, uh, this is where the digital marketing enter. Uh, this is about promotion. In terms of promotion, uh, for a good e-commerce businesses that would do better digital marketing, the content for promotion should be educating, entertaining, and engaging. So uh, it's, it's easier said than done. There are ways to do that. Um, I hope the students reviewing now would watch the digital marketing replays of the past webinars that I made. So this is related to that, especially branding. Um, for the succeeding ones, I'll be offering or discussing uh, a new type of digital marketing template that includes branding that you can use for your businesses. And lastly, content could be used to retain customers and to uh, create raving fans or loyal fans, which would refer you to their circle of influence. So that's the loyalty part. It's not just acquiring customers using promotion. Um, content can also be used to retain customers so that they would not churn or they would not go to your competitor. So the better content, the better you are in terms of retaining your customers. That, that would require um, um, content that would engage them, maybe how to use, uh, how to uh, improve the life of the product they are buying and offering tips or something. And maybe just an email, uh, email, regular email that would send maybe special offers, discounts for repeat purchases, something like that. So content is um, the, the, the big issue now because of uh, what happened because of the pandemic. Most businesses 
went online. Even if they are offering the physical store, they promoted online. So content is now the, the issue because everyone is just posting online. We should be as good, smart entrepreneurs. We'll be one step ahead. And that is through better content for our digital marketing. Now, uh, just to recap, an e-commerce business is different from the typical traditional physical business in these four factors. You should have an electronic store wherein your customer transact with the business. You have payment gateways wherein exchange of value will be done electronically. You should have logistics to send in case you'll be selling physical items. And then the content that would be representing your product or service and a way to promote. So if you have these four factors, you can consider yourself an e-commerce business, regardless if you're having or you're just renting a condo, uh, maybe you, your electronic store is uh, Airbnb. That is a marketplace type of electronic store. Payment can be made on the marketplace uh, or Airbnb's native payment option, credit card, I believe. In terms of logistics, because a rental business is a service type of business, there's no really logistics. Logistics is more on the communication and that would be just uh, a breeze. And fourth is content. So how good is the images on your marketplaces? How good are you in terms of offering additional content for them to go back to your uh, rental business? So it doesn't matter what type of business you have as long as you have these four you can call yourself an e-commerce business. So this would be a takeoff to the e-commerce project that we'll be doing for the next activity after assignment number three. Now, before I continue to the second part of the discussion, the assignment number three, which is uh, market research to customer development, customer interviews, and concept testing, uh, some students requested an extension because uh, their interviewees are not yet responding. So I've extended that for a week. So it is now shown in the e-commerce or, or in the My Portal uh, course site. So you can see that uh, it is extended. All right. So we go to a different topic altogether. Uh, we go to how we can manage an idea into a sustainable business. Now, Lean Startup is a principle, a principle that use experimentation as a way to find the best business idea for us or the best solution for customer problems and at the end the best business model that is sustainable now lean startup principle says that's the the best way to find the next big idea is not just to think and that and then say it's the best but to continuously test lots and lots of ideas until you find the best one packed by data backed by customer feedback, and backed by actual customers wanting to pay for your product or service. Lead startup principle is a simple build, measure, learn. So you build something, you go out and offer that and test that to actual customers, measure, measure the, the results, and learn. Uh, whatever insights you'll be getting from the data, from the, the, the execution or the testing. And then you continuously build, improve your initial build, which we'll be talking about later. 
you continue until you find the best business idea for you. Now, uh, it seems like a lot, but it is a good way to actually conduct an actionable market research. This is one type of market research where you track actions, not what people say. Uh, I've experienced this numerous times. You conduct survey, you ask whether you would buy this, would you pay for this? Because Filipinos are too friendly, too nice. They would just say yes and they would uh, say whatever that would please you as a, uh, an entrepreneur wanted just to test your business idea. But when you ask if they would pay for this, you actually ask for money, it would be a different topic altogether. They would not, usually they would not just uh, get their wallet and give you money. So Lean Startup is a principle for doing actionable market research through testing. And through testing, you learn and use that learning to build a better version of your business model and your product. Now, Lean Startup focuses on the continuous innovation because entrepreneurs that learn fast and outlearn their competition get to build what customers really want. This is because when you do something, when you start something, people will just copy your successes. And if you're not learning fast enough, they would they would be they could be better than you. So learning is something uh, uh, a unique trait for good entrepreneurs. When you learn fast, you can integrate the learning faster and you can improve better relative to competition. So imagine if you're starting a show my business and your kapit bahay so it is successful. People are, people are lining up. If they just uh, put an, uh, a kiosk right across the street, your market would be half. Your, your market would be split in two. So if you're not innovating enough, it would be easily copied by your competitors because it is an opportunity for them. So maybe if you're into show my business and you learn that your Kapit Bahai would compete with you, maybe you could uh, offer uh, your customers would want loyalty programs, sort of like that. So you can only discover that when you do continuous testing, continuous uh, customer development uh, programs wherein you ask for feedback. And uh, by doing so, you are one step ahead of the competition. That's the game now in online business because when you sell something that is too profitable, people would flock that uh, vertical or that category or that product. So when we talk about Lean Startup and the Build, Measure, Learn, the usual approach is that of a typical uh, 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 entrepreneur is that problem solution fit. Problem solution fit is where you identify the problem, you've written down plans that would fit that problem in terms of uh, a product or service as a solution. So this is just a simple exercise or drawing or a plan. Um, up the perfect example is where you write your business model in a business model canvas tool. That, that way, you have an idea that this problem uh, is solved by these product and services or the benefit they offer. Most entrepreneurs who started the plan expect that they would scale immediately. Uh, so it is just uh, a, a hockey stick curve wherein sales would just skyrocket. 
But in reality, you need to go to a stage wherein you need to find the proper market that would adopt or that would want the exact product you're offering. So this is where the testing, the rigorous testing would happen before you get to the scaling part. So this is somehow related to the, the, the cycle of a business wherein you start with a startup stage, you invest, you try to do plans, and then there's a growth stage wherein you're trying to get as much customers as you want. And then the scale part, that is where a business would become mature. Before you become mature, we're in stable, stable number of customers, stable number of revenues would happen. You need to test your assumption. You need to test your business model, your plans, and then your product and service you're offering. Is it really fit with the needs of your target market? So as I mentioned a while ago, the, the traditional way that people do business, they plan, they write a 50, 100 page business plan. And then when they finish, they put all their money and then launch. When they launch, they would pray that it would work. But in my experience, doing a business plan without the proper market research or experience would usually fail. It only happens when maybe there is a, a seasoned uh, employee who really knows the, uh, the industry and creates a business out of it. That could work. But for a typical Filipino who just thought of an idea, create a business plan, and expect that it would be successful instantly, most of the time, nine, uh, nine out of 10 Filipino would fail in that approach. Now, the good way or the more attuned to today's uncertainty in the business environment is that you create a plan and then you test before you launch. That way, you can minimize the risk. Minimize the risk wherein customers would uh, or you're selling something that would uh, no one want something like that so you need to test first to minimize the risk so that when you launch you're sure that you have a sustainable business model so this is a, a visual representation of what you did in the first activity second activity which is the first one you thought of problems problems that could be a source of business idea so <clears throat> excuse me so you expose problems you identified problems uh, in a certain market or or based on your experience and then you create choices maybe not in the actual submission that you've made for assignment number one <clears throat> but I'm pretty sure that you thought of several solutions, a version of it on your mind, and you, you, you converge into a, the, the best idea that you have, and that is listed on your submission. So you shortlisted some of the solution. And after you shortlist the solution, you created a business model. Uh, through the business model canvas. Now, if you have that plan or a business model captured by the business model canvas, you would test that solution or test that business model, whether it is correct or the assumptions you made there are correct. Because at the end of the day, the business model canvas is an elaborate, sophisticated guess. We are not 100% sure if that would work. So we need to test those assumptions in the business model. Would this customer really want this benefit? What are the evidences uh, that we have? So when we start a business model, there is no 
evidence. So we need to test so that we have a different mindset in implementing our e-commerce business. Why? Because in today's world, it's full of uncertainty. Technology are emerging. New activities or new preferences are, are evolving or, or consumer preferences. Simply copying a bunch of tactics, marketing, operational tactics of your competitors or of your model business would not work because number one, you have different set of customers and you have different set of capabilities. So if you just copy and you will not uh, use learning as a way to improve it, you would be left behind by uh, better companies or better online entrepreneurs. Now, these are some of the mindset that you should have when you are talking about e-commerce startup management or, where, or if you would be starting a new online business. The product, number one, is about the plan or the business model. It says that the business model is the product. Now, don't be confused. You have the product, but if you don't have the engine to convert that into cash or into revenue, you don't have a business. So basically, what you're finding is that the system that would convert your product into cash by selecting the correct customer or customer segment, finding the correct channel to deliver, finding the processes involved, and then uh, uh, matching the cost and the revenue so that at the end, you would be left with profits. So that is the product. It's not the actual product. It's the engine that would generate cash for you. So that's one of the mindset you should have if you're starting an online business. Second, it's not the solution or the product. You need to prioritize customer needs, customer problems, rather than the product you're selling. You need, you need to think uh, in the shoes or in the perspective of your customer so that you can offer better solution, better version of the products, or maybe a bundle of products if, they're oper if, you're, if you're just reselling items. <clears throat> Third is uh, traction is the goal. Traction is just converting unaware visitors into happy paying customers. So it's like uh, a website, it has maybe um, a million traffic. How much of that million traffic is converting into actual paying customers? So this one, the, these customers would be clicking the checkout buttons. So that's uh, traction. That's the percentage of unaware visitors or uh, people interested in your business, in your product, and turning them into actually or actual paying happy customers. Then we have uh, the, uh, the prioritization on, in the mindset of entrepreneurs who want to start an e-commerce business. This is in relation to lean startup, continuous innovation. It's about the right action at the right time. In, in the, the misconception for new entrepreneurs is that I want to do everything. Uh, maybe I would just try posting and not pay for ads. Or maybe I'll do everything from accounting to uh, cleaning up, everything. In starting a business, everything is variable. Everything fluctuates except for time. Time is a linear thing. And when we talk about stable 
or linear time, money is not the most important part of the business. It's time because you need to have the best efficient processes to generate as much uh, or, or to find out the best business model. That said, whatever your strengths are, focus on that. Focus on the core strength that you have in the core business you'll be doing. Maybe if you're selling, uh, selling microphones, for example, you focus on finding the customers that would want that microphone. Outsource or maybe uh, find third-party services or employees that will do the accounting for you. Um, other, other activities that is not related in getting more customers. So that's right action, right time. Prioritize uh, activities that is related to getting customers and uh, prioritizing your strength over other parts of your or, or other parts that you need to learn before doing. Fifth, tackle the riskiest assumption. The riskiest assumption in a business model is do the product is really desired by your target market. That's the number one uh, assumption. And do these customers have this specific need? And that need is solved by your product or service. You need to find that in a more uh, data-driven way. So that is through experimentation. Constraints are a gift. This is a way for entrepreneurs to extract creativity. When you have finite resources, you need to be creative enough to find solutions on your operations, on your marketing, so that uh, um, you can find or you can learn more about your customers and you would be one step ahead of the competition. And you can only do that if you do the lean startup, build, measure, learn uh, approach. Seventh, hold yourself externally accountable. You write, uh, you write your goals and then uh, uh, maybe expose that goal to your team, to external individuals that would hold you accountable. The last three is related to what I've mentioned uh, numerous times. Make uh, or play small bets. This is where you create small experiments to test whether your, your assumption is uh, proven or falsified. Uh, an example of this is the activity number three, where you need, you have this business model, you assume that this product would be bought by this type of segment you actually ask them. So that is a, a small bet wherein you test. Uh, a more sophisticated uh, bets are you create samples and then actually offer that to individuals and ask for feedback. That way you can get as much learning for you to improve the business. Uh, that said, when you do experiments, you create data and that data becomes your evidence uh, evidence for a better decision making because data is a decision support system. It is an objective way for you to know if you are right or wrong, basically. And number 10, with that experimentation, with that uh, continuously testing ideas, uh, you would have unexpected outcomes. And that unexpected outcome usually is the recipe for uh, the best business model or the eureka moment that you'd be use, using for you to scale up your business. You can only do that when you go out the building, talk to customers, do experiments as compared to just writing the typical business plan, the lengthy one. You, would do, you don't have that discovery when you just write in on your computers. So uh, 
what is the build in the build measure learn principle of uh, lean startup this is the minimum minimum viable product a minimum viable product is the smallest thing you can build that that delivers customer value and as a bonus it could capture some of the value back uh, an example of value could be personal information if they left their email or maybe phone number for you for you to contact in case you would be actually producing uh, the the product or maybe advance orders something like that so the perfect example of the minimum viable product is something like uh, I'm, I'm planning it, this is an actual example i'm planning to start a food business wherein uh, we're creating some unique recipe that would want to offer in a form of uh, a more upscale uh, rotisserie type uh, chicken recipe okay so I want to test if that business idea would work. So we tested out, make, made some uh, small batch, actually not small, just two. We tested out two uh, whole chicken. We did the recipe, measured everything, and we sold, actually sold that in the informal barangay Facebook group. Uh, I know every one of us have this Facebook group of the that barangay or municipality, uh, which is a result of the lockdowns we had the past two years. So uh, this is where this small businesses would offer their product. So mine is that I have this uh, assumption or a business model we're in uh, an upscale, better version of the Andox, something like that. I made a sample, two chickens. That's a sample. And actually sold that in the local barangay Facebook group. Now, uh, my intention is not to get money. My intention is for them to taste the actual food item and ask for feedback and ask if the price point is of value. So that's one of uh, the, the assumption I'm trying to, trying to uh, find out if that is true. And that would be based on actual feedback, open-ended feedback. And by doing so, kwentuhan lang, that I could discover some of the hidden truths that uh, my customer would typically have when, when they purchase something of that. Because when you offer something or you start something, start a business, start a business idea, in, or, or yeah, start a business, you are actually stealing customers from uh, existing businesses. So if you're offering similar, you won't get that customer. Uh, you're urging them to fire their existing uh, providers of maybe, in, I mean, in my case, uh, chicken, rotisserie type, uh, an upscale type. If that is not better than the existing ones they are purchasing, 100%, they would not buy from the, the, the business I'm planning to do. So something like that. So a minimum viable product is a way to get as much learning with the least cost I can do. Okay. Now, some of the minimum viable product, the basic ones, you can go back on the business model development replay or webinar replay. I've enumerated many minimum viable product ideas uh, for B2, B2B, B2C, for service businesses, and different types of, of uh, uh, business concepts. 
the the typical ones are first customer interviews that you'd be doing for your assignment number three and that is integrated with concept test concept test is like you have a brochure of an actual business that is not existing you just want to get feedback what i've made the example that i just told a while ago is a prototype or sampling i use actual sample to get feedback as if i am offering that uh, to many customers and then fourth is you uh, pre-sale uh, some of the the ideas you're trying to push so if you have this idea try to get pre-orders something like that but that's uh, your minimum viable product, the basic ones. Now, this is a different concept altogether. Uh, taking Lean Startup in a more uh, technical way. Uh, this is traction. Traction is customer, cost, customer throughput. Throughput is the rate in which you create happy customers. From unaware visitor, in my example, you have a website, you have 1 million uh, site visits. What is the rate wherein that million cost of visitors of your website would be converted into happy paying customers? So that is uh, the traction. For a small business, tracking happy paying customers is a good way. For you to create a sustainable business model. Uh, this is how a typical business would generate revenue. So you acquire customers. There is an activation or, or, or if you happen to view the branding and the content marketing, uh, this is somehow related to conversion. This is where people would pay the business. And that happy customer could be retained for a certain period. So they would be actually paying again for additional, for repeat purchases. And they could also refer the business to their friends, to their family, so that you can get more customers. And at the end, you get revenue and the sale. Now, this image is more operational in perspective. And when you talk about marketing perspective, you, have, you would build awareness. When you build awareness, you can get consideration. They would leave something. They would ask you. Uh, they would leave comments on may, maybe ask for discounts and when they convert they would pay uh, the business in exchange for the product and services you're selling when they become loyal is where they refer or they would buy again from you so at the end it's still revenue so traction is like a factory of unaware unaware individuals into happy customers so there is a, a scenario, a, a principle here. The objective of a business is to make happy customers and not make customers happy. Medyo nakakalito. But when we talk about making customers happy, it involves costs. You provide discounts. You provide freebies for them to generate interest in buying from you. So involve cost for a business. But we talk about happy customers. These are satisfied customers who have their problems solved or need satisfied. So it's a different thing altogether. Uh, it again boils down to the product market fit and problem solution fit. Are you really targeting the correct customers and are you really offering or, or satisfying the need or solving the problems that they have. So that's a, a, a good analogy for this customer factory, making 
happy customers from unaware visitors to happy customers or not making them happy okay so uh, a quick recap uh, of this uh, this video is that as a smart entrepreneur we should be detectives finding clues within the market that we can use to build our case. We are not fortune tellers wherein you just plan, execute, and pray that it would happen or, or your plan would be 100% successful. Most of the time, when we plan and we're not really well-versed in that industry, most of the time, we would fail. Why? Because we really don't know how our market behaves how our market preferences are and how well our products or services match to our customer needs, wants, and problems. So a smart entrepreneur, we need to follow the scientific method. And that's another principle of Lean Startup. We build hypotheses, we build experiment, measure result, and learn and improve in the Previous example that I have, the actual uh, prototype testing or sample test experiment that I made, uh, I plan to have this uh, sort of food business, chicken, rotisserie, uh, the, the closest that I can identify is the typical rotisserie chicken you saw in the Kanto or mga andoks, baliwags of the world. So that's the, that's the closest that I can uh, match. So if I would just create a plan, put my money there, I'm sure that it won't be successful. Because I'm since if I be competing with the Andocs and the Baliwags, they can easily uh, make adjustment and battle me head on. Now, if I would be smart enough to know how can I compete, how can I identify the correct market segment, and how can I tweak my product to match the target I'm plan aiming for, I would minimize the risk of failure as compared to the previous approach. That is why I created an hypothesis. My small hypothesis is that the recipe that I have that we develop would be liked by our customer. In a scale of 1 to 10, our target is 9 and 10. So the question we'll be asking, are you would be willing to recommend this product to your family and friends? And it's that. 1 to 10 rating scale. Pili sila. 1 through 10. That's as simple as that. And then I would ask for open-ended uh, questions. What qualities do they like? Did they like? Uh, uh, is the, pro, the price matched with, with the value they, they think of the, the, the sample? So that's that's uh, a simple hypothesis. And the experiment is simply uh, asking or selling in the informal Facebook barangay group that uh, everyone have. So just post there, uh, sell. Uh, in my case, I sold for 500 pesos, uh, a small chicken with a unique recipe. And then... Uh, after that, I talked to the individual. Since you would be talking to that individual, they would uh, you would get their delivery address, um, their payment option, some sort of like that. Then you get their number. And when they have the product after their consumption, I would ask them certain questions and uh, would tell them this is part of a, a quick, quick experiment and maybe we can use them again for or 
um, market research and would offer him the freebies uh, uh, on the next run, on the next iteration or the next experiment or stuff like that. I would measure result. And in the hypothesis part, I've listed some of the guests that, uh, or my guess is that they would be answering or picking number 10 when I ask them, how, what's the rate of you recommending the product to your family and friends on a scale of one to 10, 10 the highest? My, my guess is they would pick 10. So I would check whether their actual feedback matches my hypothesis. And from there, based on the result, based on the qualitative or the open-ended quintuhan, I would back, I would go back to the drawing board and see what, what elements I did good, did bad, and how can I improve. And this is just on a week's time. Imagine if you do that weekly, uh, after a month, that is uh, a good source of learning. And my initial uh, experiment or respondent is the barangay. And that is through the Facebook group. So it's simple, quick, and I can get as much learning as compared to actually investing in a small kiosk, small uh, space, and implementing the plan that I have. And since I'm not well-versed in this food industry venture, I would do small experiments to make my uh, assumption verified rather than trying to implement my plan and then pray for the best. Uh, we would use science, the scientific method, and that's one way to be a smart entrepreneur and being a detective rather than a fortune teller. So uh, last, last would be the what to test. Now, uh, what I mentioned a while ago is testing the feasibility of the product. But what for the whole business? Uh, determine your minimum success criteria. This is a monetary value. How much ang target sales you know, for the year. Simple as that. Let's say uh, 3 million, 3 million and target ko for that business. Now, for that 3 million product price is 500, for example, I need to get 6,000 6, paying customers for me to get uh, a minimum 3 million sales. So one and two is related. You determine your target. And by target, target revenue is uh, not really representative of how well you're creating uh, happy customers. So you need to convert that into number of customers. And from that number of customers, you go back to the customer factory analogy. How much unaware individual you need to promote to to get to that 6,000? So now when you start that, uh, when you start that question, line of questioning for your business, you don't have numbers. That is why you need to test how much uh, for example, you have this e-commerce store. For a hundred uh, hundred uh, website visit, how many of that one hundred would become paying customer? And by uh, dividing that, you could get the throughput number or conversion rate. You can get uh, and reverse that. Uh, computation from 6,000 divide by the percentage how much individual I need to promote to and uh, how much is the rate, how much is the, the referral rate you need you can only do that if you test and that is uh, the third one 
that is refining your business model against your minimum success criteria. And the tool is the MVP experiments. Uh, as I mentioned a while ago, um, for me, it's just a simple barangay experiment that I have. But I'm not into the actual business pa. It's more on the product testing first because that is the core of the idea that I have. I need to test if the target market and the product matches so that I have um, product solution fit or product market fit, sorry, product market fit. When I have that, I can focus on building the business and focusing on how to create happy customers. So um, this would be the end of our, our well, supposedly one hour, uh, one hour video. Now, if you want to read more of uh, the concept, especially the Lean Startup thing and the traction thing, um, the references that I used, I just mashed up based on my experience. You can read through the Lean Startup by Eric Ries, Running Lean and Scaling Lean by uh, Ash Moria. So uh, you can uh, find books about that and read. Is it's a good way to, to uh, uh, equip yourself in how to minimize more risk and creating better online businesses. However, those, those books are more geared to the software type of businesses, uh, software startups. I just mash them up in the actual 